Hello and welcome to Surviving Scientology Radio. This is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. We're available online at survivingscientologyradio.com or at YouTube, Surviving Scientology. With us today is a returning guest, Mark Headley, blown for good. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, man. Hey, good to hear from you. We always love having you on the show, and I'm sure that David Miscavige listens when you're on. I'm sure he tunes in in his office. Doesn't he have very expensive sound systems in his office? He has sound systems, and well, he has them in all of his offices. So in Clearwater, he has these systems in Los Angeles, and especially at the the Int headquarters, the Int base or the Gold base. He has a sound system in his Building 50. So next to his office, he has like a listening room that's like down the hall or in the in the same wing in his wing of that building. But in that in that listening room, you know, the speakers are a hundred thousand dollar set of speakers. Just the one hundred thousand. Just the speakers. You know, the amplifiers are you know fifteen thousand dollar each. The, you, you, I mean, it's got. Uh, it's got a ten thousand dollar turntable that is powered by a vacuum, and uh, you know, you name it. Uh, Custom made audio switchers, the highest end CD player, digital audio tape players, DVD players, VHS players. It's got. It, it's it's like if you were an audiophile, one of these people that listens to, you know, vinyl and t- has tube amps and all this stuff. It's like if you let that person loose in a super, super, super high-end audio store, and they had an unlimited spending budget, that's the the listening system that they would build, is the one that he has. And then, so he has that one at at the Ant Base. He's got one that's very similar. It might even, now, it might even be better than the one he has at uh, Gold, but he has one of those in Clearwater. He has one of those in Los Angeles. He has these things all over the place. I think in UK, he's got kind of like a ghetto version that, you know, the whole room only costs, you know, 200,000. But um yeah, we're talking we're talking millions and millions of dollars worth of audio equipment just for him. No 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 one else is allowed to go in there and mess with that stuff. It's just him. Now, by way of contrast, when you were working uh at Gold Base, how much did they spend on food per day for you lowly Sea Org members? Well, this is a point that it's been disputed by Scientology, but from what I remember, and I was on the financial planning committee, so I could see how much they were spending on food. But I remember the, the services division, which was the, the division of Golden Era, which was responsible, that had the, you know, the stewards and the galley and the chefs and all that in it. And they bragged that they were feeding us for a buck a day. So a buck a day per person. So you're talking about $300 a day for 300 people. They, they were serving us breakfast, lunch, and dinner for that amount of money. You know, that, that is outrageous. The, uh, the church has protested in um, Lawrence Wright's book, Going Clear, Scientology, Hollywood, and the Prison of Belief. He mentions that figure. Uh, they're about... And the church actually put up on its uh, attack website on Mr. Wright that they claim to be spending more uh, per day than, you know, is spent by prisons. <laughs> now, this is like this is not a way to brag. That's, this that's is, Scientology. What do they call it? Glutz PR. <laughs> oh, no kidding. Glutz PR. Well, I went on I went online and I found it in, I believe, the years 2010. California prisons were spending three dollars and 41 cents per day per prisoner for food. Yeah. And the church is bragging on their website that they're spending more than that. Well, you know, I know I, exactly what they did. They said, how much are they spending at the prisons? 341. They go, good. We're up in the allocation from a dollar to 342 a person. <laughs> they're, We're going to have bragging toast. That, We're having toast with those eggs in the morning now. There you go. But it is true they buy a lot of eggs because they, they give some interesting numbers. And I don't think it is Glutz PR because it's nothing to brag about. It's like saying, it, you know what? It, what I have written, it's never a good day for your cult when you say, hey, we beat those human trafficking, trafficking charges in court. That's not a good thing to say. Or we comply with all child labor laws. Those are not good statements to make. Well, and also, because so. you know that 
Uh, you, obviously, you've seen a lot of five star reviews for prison food on Yelp and, and that kind of thing. So, <laughs> so it's like, well, yeah, we're 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 paying more than these guys are spending on prisoners. You know, like so. But OK, but OK, let's say they're spending three bucks a day. OK, for the sake just, of argument, just to okay. say, OK, you know what, guys? Listen, if you say you spend it, I mean, this was, I was there 1990 to 2005. So a time's gone by. There's inflation. Okay, let's say they're spending three bucks now. Okay, fine. David Miscavige, when I was there, was, they were spending at least $300 a day on just him. So he's got food, C Santa Monica Seafood, this, uh, a restaurant. Uh, it's like a restaurant, sort of like a seafood deli uh, n near the ocean. And that van or truck was coming to the base every day to bring him his food. So his food's being driven from the ocean. Okay, we're in the middle of the desert. His food's being driven from the ocean at three at a cost of at least three hundred dollars per day for just him. So he's literally spending three hundred dollars a day. And, and don't get me wrong, I've gone out for really nice dinner every once in a while, and it might have been a few hundred dollars for me and my wife and you know my dad or whoever else is with us. Well, David Miscavige is doing that every day of every week of every year, while people around him are being fed for less than what I spend on dog food. I mean that that's well, now, pretty dis despicable. Now for our it is it's very despicable and for our listeners who do not know Southern California it's a long drive from Santa Monica out to San Jacinto. What do you I'd say? I'd say it's well I'd say it's a good two to three hours with traffic. I mean you're they're leaving in the morning and they're getting there before lunch with his you know sushi and his fresh shrimp and you know whatever the fresh whatever fresh fish he's eating. And um, so, yeah, it's it's that sort so of thing. And, and, and even that. OK, one time th they're spending all this money on food. One time there was no food for the galley to cook for the crew. There just wasn't anything there. They were scrounging for something to make us for lunch. And they had dug out these tacos, these taco shells that had gone off. And they, these things had been around for months. Who knows, knows how long that they were sitting wherever they were sitting? But they found these things. Yeah. And they knew that they were a little, you know, a little hinky. So they poured all of – they drizzled olive oil all over these taco shells. And they put them on all these cooking trays. And they put them in the ovens and heated them up with the olive oil on them to try and kind of drown out the – the, the yeah. rottenness of the, of them, <laughs> and um, they and then they got some whatever meat that they'd rounded up, and they made tacos for everybody for lunch. Pretty much everybody ate these things. Within, I'd say about two or three hours later, every bathroom on the base had a line outside of it, and these rotten tacos were coming out of both ends of at least fifty percent of the crew. I mean, it was okay. it was a wipeout. It was a big investigation, and 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 this whole thing happened because there wasn't any food. So they can say they were spent the money. Well, then how do you, how does your food services division how do they run out of food to make for the entire crew, and to the point where they're serving the crew rotten food? So it's, it's well, a this, joke. This race is you – know, no kidding. You rancid tacos. The entire base is, is sick at, with food poisoning. And as I've raised on ScientologyMoneyProject.com, the church has $1.5 billion. You've got all the money in the world. It's a lot of money. Well, that's, it, the, that's I, the other thing. It's like whatever money is, is, is there that exists for David Miscavige, well, that wasn't the same pot that our money was coming from for the Golden Era Productions crew. So you could have, you know, a shirt. You could have two shirts that you have that you're supposed to make last all week and your the elbows are blown out and they're they're actually worn through like they're they're shredded. The elbows are from just worn through on your on your long sleeve polyester shirt that we're wearing in the middle of the desert because that makes a lot of sense. But um but but you can't get another shirt because there's not enough money for uniforms. But David Miscavige, his freaking beagles have uniforms. So it's like there's a there's a discrepancy on how much is available for him and then how much is available for us. And we were just like peons, so it was sort of like, you know, whatever. You got two shirts, you know, suck it up. Yeah, just uh, cope with your polyester shirt. The church, 
finance policy is so Byzantine, so stingy and selfish and cruel that you, you know, Chris Shelton has been on the radio here to explain how you can eat rice and beans and all the money goes up every week and disappears. Yeah. Now, the, what the church, one thing they love to do because they are a business is make big, fat profit margins on everything. How much does, you know, the, let's talk about e-meters. Okay. The, uh, the uh, Mark 7 e-meter, the quantum meters, and before we get to the new Ultra Mark 8, super deluxe, 50,000 times more sensitivity, how much did it cost to make your basic Mark 7 or quantum? Well, when I was there, we were making these things pretty much all the parts, all the raw parts were being assembled and made to work at Golden Era. So uh, we had a plastics manufacturer that would stamp the, the shell of the meter, and uh, it was like an injection molding type system. And then the circuit boards were being made at a circuit board manufacturing plant. And then um, they would make all the wire harnesses and all that stuff would all be assembled at Golden Era. And I think the cost was, we, I mean, we had not so good purchasing power and, you know, rush shipping here and, oops, we forgot to order this. Let's get that here right away, rush charge. And I think all in all, it was about $400 a meter to make a Mark 7. And those Mark 7s, the price on those would be anywhere from four thousand to twenty-five thousand dollars for one of those meters. So, like they have a Orange County Orange Edition, I think it's it's twenty thousand dollars for that meter. That twenty thousand dollar meter was being made at Golden Era for four hundred bucks. That and that and that, that that's the high end. It could be could have been a lot cheaper if if it was you know if it was done better. But $400 is a, is a good figure for how much one of those cost. There were times when these e-meters were being made by the kids from the ranch. The, 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 the children of the Sea Org members that worked at the property, they would come for the day and work on repairing and manufacturing e-meters at the base. And we're talking, you know, 9-year-olds, 10-year-olds, up to probably 14-year-olds. So they, this is Castile Ranch nearby? That's right. The Castile Canyon, the what was called, uh, what do they call that place? I forgot, Happy Valley, because that's where the crazy people from the base would go to. Um, and, yeah, uh, Happy Valley. It's also where the RP, when there was an RPF uh, for the Int base, that's also where it was located for many years, was at Happy Valley. This sounds like third world child labor nine-year-olds working on circuit boards yeah i thought that the, now the church likes to represent that children get educated they don't yeah i mean they weren't even they, it was sort of like okay here's a solder gun okay good we want to attach this to this this to this okay here you go do a hundred of those you know it's just like that sort of thing watch watch That's me do one link. okay good you do one okay watch me do another one okay good you're good to go do the rest so so when you're saying the best product made at the the utmost quality it was it was the what can we get by with doing by whoever we've got to do it and that's another thing i just realized as i'm saying this is that a lot of times when you'd have a person that was in it management and uh, they were like some big head honcho or some manager or some you know in charge of some entire sector of scientology like the the missions or the the able sector or something like that when they'd get busted, they'd go to like the grounds department or they'd go to HEM, which, the, which, which was Hubbard Electro Meter Manufacturing. So they would go and make meters because they were, you know, scumbags of the property. So, okay, we're going <laughs> to send you down to do a robot's job down in Golden Era. Uh, you know, you're going to solder stuff all day long. So it was sort of kind of like it wasn't a high and, uh, high and lofty position if you were, you know, in the – in the meter department making meters but but okay so that's the that's the mark seven then when they came out with the quantum which was really just putting some ferrites on the wire harnesses and i think swapping on a circuit board that was you know somebody realized that this 20 year old analog technology was you know could have been upgraded a little bit to digital <laughs> that's essentially it was a software and maybe a chip update is what the quantum was. And we would literally, those things would come in, we'd scrub them down, 
and then we'd rip off the tag that said Quanta or uh, Smark Seven and slap on a badge that said Quantum, and then uh, they'd go through the regular meter repair line and they'd you know double check this calibration and that and the wet and the other thing and and then you know Baba Booey, you've got a Quantum. Um, but then they when in 1990, 1995 when Dave was at flag at, at the Florida, the Clearwater, Florida headquarters. He was playing an L. Ron Hubbard lecture for the, the auditors there. And that's when he came up I, with the idea for the Mark 8 Ultra e-meter. And the Mark 8 Ultra meter, now I don't know how true this is. This is what David Miscavige bragged. But he basically said that he got the manufacturing price on the meter down to $40 a pop. So each one Forty bucks, and that's on the and that's on the Mark Eight Ultra, and that's by making them in in Kaohsiung or wherever the heck they're making them overseas. Um, they're making them on the same production line that made Sony Walkmans. Now that was in 2004 when those were produced, and now if you think about the technology that existed in the early 2000s that culminated in this meter finally coming to fruition in 2004, and then the technology that's happened in the last 10 years, that meter is completely and 100% outdated. It is a, literally a piece of junk by today's technology standards, and they're still, and they even increased the price of the meter. He got the price down to 10 times as less, according to him, and now they're charging more than they charged for the Mark you know, seven quantum. And that same meter, if you took that technology that exists in there and you compared it to something like an Apple iTouch, an Apple iTouch you can buy for 200 bucks and it's got insane amounts of technology that's built into it and it could do everything that the meter does. The, the, an Apple iTouch could be an e-meter with, sure. with a tiny little app it has a, everything and more than that meter has for 200 bucks. Like I could make an app tomorrow that does exactly what the e-meter does, and you could plug the cans into the headphone outfit, uh, uh, headphone jack, and bingo, you'd have a meter. The one thing that I found very reprehensible about the new Mark 8 Ultra e-meter, in fact, this is where David Miscavige just slapped Scientologists right in the face. He said it's 50,000 times more sensitive. <laughs> that he should be sued for. If, if he's RTC guaranteeing the ecclesiastical purity of the Scientology religion, and he knowingly withheld that meter for 10 years before release, that means all of your auditing was 50,000 times less sensitive. Well, see, that's another thing. He, they say stuff like that all the time. It doesn't mean anything and and th th there's no way that they're trying to do what they say they're trying to do because just like the e-meter okay so you're making an e-meter for 40 bucks you're charging the parishioners or your members or whoever you're selling this thing to you're charging them four thousand dollars okay that's a hell of a markup okay and like i said i could make a meter like i could take an ipad which is about the same size as their meter and that could have yep. a digital version of their meter, and it would do the exact same thing. And guess what? It would be even more sensitive because 10 years of technology has gone by since they made their meter, and the chips and the processing power and everything is, is way it's, – it's exponentially more sensitive than it was in 2004. Okay, that, so that's that. Now you take the lectures. When I was there when we were making lectures on cassettes, they were costing about a buck fifty each to produce, and then they were charging anywhere from thirty dollars to fifty dollars uh, each when you you put them in a set. You know, you get a set of ten of these things for five hundred bucks. Okay, after the entire world went to digital downloads, they finally managed to move to cassettes to CDs. So everybody else is using iTunes, and they're like, you know what? We're going to come out with CDs now. So <laughs> they went to CDs. Okay, a CD cost about I think it's like 0.25 cents to make like it's it's less than a penny that's how much it co yeah. costs to make a CD it, it's cents whatever it is it's in the cents 
Okay, now they're selling the lectures for $50 to $75 each. Okay, now here's what I like to talk to. When I, I, every once in a while, I get Scientologists that contact me and they go, well, you know, what about this or what about that? They ask me all these questions. And this is what I tell them. Okay, I just told you how much it costs to make an e-meter. I just told you how much it costs to make a lecture. Okay, in order to make these lectures, they're digitizing them. Because in order to make a, a glass master, you're digitizing the, the audio to then turn it into a master that can make it into a CD. Okay, well, don't make the CD. Don't, make the, don't print it on a CD. Don't print a CD. Don't make the e-meter. You could take every single course, every single lecture, every single film, the e-meter. You could take every single thing that they sell in Scientology, everything. And you could put it on one iPad. Everything. You could take – there's nothing. You could take all the organizational policies, all the technical policies, all the lectures, the transcripts, the audio files, every single thing. And you could put it on one iPad and you could sell it to these people. You could – let's go crazy. Let's sell it to them for $1,000. And then they could take it anywhere. They could audit on it. They could do whatever they want. If you were really trying to get this stuff out to all these people, because we're we got to save the world, we got limited amount of time, and you know, oh my God, our days are numbered. That's how you would do it. But they're not doing that. They're selling CDs. It's 2014, and they're telling these members, oh, look, we just released these lectures on CD. You're like, you're like, really? Like, I don't even know if I have a CD player. Like, I just bought a laptop. It doesn't have a CD drive on it. But like, who's using that? You know, so, the, the, it, but the cost. So even if you're, even just for the lectures, okay, fine. We're going to do it on CD. If it's costing you a penny, why are you charging me 75 bucks for this thing? Yeah, and that's, the, that's part of the bad faith of the church is, is, they're not using modern technology, not be, because they can't, because they don't want to. It's more profitable to stay, you know, with printed books and, and uh, CDs. Uh, yeah, like that's a great mentioned... example. I've got a book, Blown for Good, Behind the Iron Curtain of Scientology. I sell it on Amazon. I can outsell them every single week. It's not because – I don't know why it is that I outsell them, but I know a good reason. It's on Kindle. Anybody can just download it. They can get it on their iPad. They can get it on their, on their Kindle. They can get it on their computer, they, wherever. Scientology doesn't have a Dianetics book in Kindle format. Well, no, they don't, and that is really telling that they're not – they don't have book one, Dianetics, the book that started it all, blah, blah, blah. that's blah, the same reason they Kindle. don't have all these things on an iPad. Or the same reason they don't – because if they did that, once that first iPad was made – all somebody has to do is clone that one and then give it to their friend, and now their friend's got everything. And that's and why that, – that's where I say, you know what? If they were really trying to get the word out there, then they would just do it the way – do it the way everybody else is doing it. And even when I did the Kindle, somebody said, well, if you do it on the Kindle, then you know people are just going to steal it. And I'm like – so what? I want them to read it. I don't care how they get it. it uh, obviously, it took me some money to, to make it and design it and you know, do the cover and whatever, so I need to get that money back. But I don't, you know, so a few hundred people have stolen it so far. Okay, whoop de doo you know, it's, not, it's not the end of the world. At least they read the book. You know? in, the, in the book is a very interesting, useful – Kindle makes it available to people who, who want to read it. The, and here's an, here's an interesting point, Mark. The Gideon Bible Society makes Bibles available. One of my clients was a Gideon, uh, one of my customers, and he had a part of his factory, which he owned, it was privately owned, where he stored Gideon Bibles, and it was stacked to the roof with cases and cases of Gideon Bibles. He always had maybe 10,000 Bibles. Yeah. And, and the Gideons have made the Bible available free. That's how they got into the hotel rooms, you know, of the United States and certain other parts of the world. And... His spiritual commitment was to make his Bible available for free, and he donated his own money. Yeah. I think the, I think the unit cost back then of printing a Bible, this has been you know 15 years ago, was under a dollar yeah. to print a Bible, well, that, and an expensive. And the, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses do this as well. So you're going right to the central point. 
if planetary clearing is an urgency and if there's only limited time before it all goes up in smoke, why aren't you giving it yeah, away? Well, they do the same thing with Way to Happiness booklets. They, they claim this. They have this, you know, it's a non-religious moral precepts, okay? And they have these little booklets that they're printing. I mean, you've seen a Way to Happiness booklet. It's a, it's a flimsy little booklet. It's not a Bible. It's a flimsy little yeah, booklet. Just, yeah. A pamphlet. I see, yeah, a pamphlet. That's exactly what it is. It's a pamphlet. And I remember when they set up all – they were setting up all these printing presses and they were you know, getting all high tech. I think they would figured out how to print a Way to Happiness booklet for like 14 cents, you know, to, under – between 14 and 20 cents depending on how they, you know, how they designed it or how they set it all up. Okay. Well, they're they're red. They're they're trying to get Scientologists to buy like a pack of ten of these things for fifteen bucks. Like here, buy a pack of these and you know distribute them to your friends and family for fifteen bucks. Same thing. Well, you, we we know it costs you under a dollar to make a pack of ten of these things. Why don't you charge two bucks if you're really trying to get the word out? No, we're charging fifteen dollars. <laughs> it's just like, and, and they're not paying for labor. They're paying these people. You know, they're working a hundred plus hour a week and they're charging, you know, they're paying them 50 bucks. So they're not spending the money on labor. You know, wh wh where, wh where's all this money going? <laughs> well, that's the whole point. The, the Church of Scientology is all about monetizing its technology. Its so-called social betterment groups are all about monetizing the technology. So sell it in all formats through so-called social betterment. And you're going right to a key issue, Sea Org pay. You mentioned that they're not paying for labor. I mean, Sea Org pay, let's talk about that. All these people like you, when you were in from 1990 to 2005, breaking your back, how much did you make? Well, on a good week, we were paid $46 and I think it was 24 cents. It's like 46 bucks and change. And yeah. and, that, and the reason it was because it was fifty dollars base pay, but then taxes were being taken out. So because you know we got to uh, you know uh, comply to all the IRS rules here. <laughs> so getting fifty bucks, taking you know whatever it is four four bucks and change out for taxes or whatever it was three bucks or anyway. But that was on a good week. So there were years I got my social security statements after. I escaped from the Scientology compound, and there were there's years like in the '90s where it just says zero, like we didn't get paid for that year. They reported zero wages for several years of the you know the 15 years I was there. But out of that 46 bucks I got, I had to pay for toiletries, you know, shampoo, toilet paper, cigarettes, whatever I was spending that you know I needed to buy I had it had to come out of that money so the only thing that was I mean obviously they're providing a place for me to sleep and they're providing you know the three meals breakfast lunch and dinner a day but if I had a motorcycle and I had to pay the insurance and I had to pay for gas and all that all came out of my 40 bucks per week well go back for a minute mark you had to pay for your own toilet paper yeah that was a huge that's that's like a it's actually a, a kind of a famous thing within Scientology is that there's never any toilet paper anywhere yeah what do they have <laughs> it's yeah, just what like, do they have on this it's one of those things like you cuz you can you can never buy enough toilet paper so like let's say down in in uh, Los Angeles so they have all these staffs that are working i think there's like 2,000 staff that are in Los Angeles between all these different buildings. But that big blue compact complex in Hollywood, in the organizations, if, there's, if they put toilet paper in the bathrooms, the staff just take it and you know, shove it in their pocket and you know, take it home at night so they can you know, wipe when they get home. But, sure. but, so, but that's the way it is. So you could buy 1,000 rolls tomorrow. They'd all go. There's, there's 2,000 crew that, that need a roll. So they're going to they're going to grab one when they see one. And but it was like that at the ant base, too. There was there was literally announcement at the muster. So we'd have a, we'd have a, a muster at least three or four times a day where all of the crew would be accounted for to make sure no one, you know, snuck out or jumped out over a gate or whatever between, uh, you know, breakfast and lunch and lunch and dinner and dinner and the end of the night. And there were announcements by the services division. Let's say, hey, listen. 
In the bathrooms around the property, we put toilet paper under the sinks, so if the toilet paper runs out, it can be replaced. You guys have to stop stealing the toilet paper. Just leave the toilet paper in the bathrooms. Like, it was literally so much of, a, of an issue that there were frequently announcements to stop to the staff. Hey, guys, you know what? We've got people coming here from the outside world that are working in the audio mixing rooms or, you know, they're, they're professional mixers and directors. And we've got these people coming. They can't go to the bathroom and, they can't, and no toilet paper is in there because <laughs> you guys are stealing it. You know, it's like – so these guys – we're talking – this is this billion-dollar organization. They're not going to spend a couple of shekels on toilet paper. Well, Mark, Mark, but if we look at this – and now, they represented, the Church of Scientology represented to the IRS that Sea Org is an unincorporated religious order, and you make a billion-year commitment. You're the elite. The church claimed to the IRS that they provided for you, you know, food, room, and board. Yeah. But they didn't tell the IRS, we don't give them toilet yeah. paper or shampoo. Like, how does that work? Yeah. I, I would say, wait a minute, wait a minute. This whole premise is ridiculous. You claim you feed them, but you're spending a buck a day, no toilet paper. they got to do it out of their own $46 a week. This, the greed, the greed at the heart of it is really what the public should focus yeah. on, just the pure. And, and well, even that, that's a perfect example. You say on the IRS, they have these IRS forms, these forms that you've been posting. If you go through those, there's, they've got these little lies strewn throughout them. One of them. I looked at this form. It was, I think it was an ABLE form, and it had all these ABLE Sea Org members listed, and it said how many hours they work a week, and it said 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40. I'm like, 40 hours? you got to be kidding me. I worked at ABLE with those people. If we just did the bare minimum schedule, it was 100-plus hours a week. So they say they're paying them $2,000 a year, and they're working 40 hours a week. Well, but they're not. They're not paying them $2,000 a year, and they're not working 40 hours a week. They're all working 100 hours a week. So it's like, well, why aren't you showing that uh, on these forms? We, it's, a, it's public knowledge. You know, there's the Sea Org schedule is a 15-hour day, six days a week, and then if you're lucky, you get to, you know, shit shower and stay, shave on Sunday and do your laundry and they, they take three – they give you three hours for that. Clean your room, you know, wash your two shirts and your three pants and your four pairs of socks. And so that's six 15-hour days and a seventh, you know, 12-hour day. Well, that's over 100 hours. So why can't they just say that? They, but they lie. And so there's all these little kind of just – they just twist it just a little bit like, oh, no, 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 we take care of our people. Well – there's more ex Sea Org members than there are Sea Org members. There's a reason for that. Okay. Oh yeah, because of those conditions and and when you talk about the uh, IRS 990Ts and the IRS 990s I posted, one reason I posted them is they're publicly available. But secondly, I wanted uh, people who were in the Sea Organization, who worked for the church, to be able to pick them apart to see the the inconsistencies. Uh, there's a lot of details in these documents, and even in the IRS submissions they made uh, prior to tax exemption. One interesting thing, this is just kind of a humorous aside, I, I posted it on my blog yesterday, was that the Church of Scientology told the IRS in 1993 that they were planning on building a series of large, indestructible Scientology obelisks around the world, and that these obelisks were going to have... Uh, stainless steel plates affixed to them and on the plates you would have pictographic represent representations of the way to happiness etched onto the plate such that if there were you know a nuclear war even a crude civilization could decipher these plates and have the basis of a sane civilization hmm. i thought well first of all come on where's the obelisk i've yet to see one church of spiritual technology obelisk anywhere in the world Two, would you etch on these plates, don't buy toilet paper? I mean, <laughs> well, well, first of all, just because we haven't seen them don't mean they haven't built them. I mean, that, I mean, we've never – no, I don't think anyone's ever seen the vault in Montana. 
But when I was there in the late 2000s, they were building it. So there's a vault somewhere in Montana uh, that's, you know, it's a new vault. It's the, there's the New Mexico one. There's the uh, Running Springs. There's Montana. It's another yeah, there's one. Capitola, yeah, Tremontina, that's right. Montana, and I think there's one up at Washington State. The one up in uh, Washington State's near the Cascadia subduction zone. So I don't, if there's a big 9 I don't know how that does. But uh, just while we're talking about Church of Spiritual Technology, the archival preservation part of uh, their book value in 2012 was $447 million. They told the IRS they'd build one point. Eight million stainless steel records. Did you, were, did you ever see any of the CST archival stuff? Yeah. Th now, this is another thing that, like, when we were at Gold, like, if I had to buy alcohol or, you know, Q-tips to clean the audio heads on the, on the recorders that we use to make cassettes or whatever, I had to put in a PO and I had to, you know, I was putting in PO for plotter pens, you know, 36 bucks. I need some plotter pens. Um, it was like a major deal if I could get $36 through the financial planning committee. Well, when in the late 2000s, when these CST guys showed up, it was like, we need some printers. Boom. The next day, brand new, $35,000 printers. Boom. Next day, wow. $10,000 shrink wrap machine. Boom. Next day, a whole tape packing box taping machine. Poof, you know, poof, poof, poof. These CST guys were freaking pros at spending money. They could spend $10 million just like done. You know, they were, they were, you could tell they were used to spending money. They had, you know, here I am trying to get my 36 bucks through FP. You know, I'm writing a PO. I'm trying to really sell it. You know, I really need these pens. Yeah. And these guys would just like point their finger, boom, there's a $35,000 machine. It was just like, what? You know, so... For them to, to – we saw tons of stuff they were doing, these plates they were making, um, all this stuff, the, the, the records, the etched metal records and uh, the titanium time capsules and all this stuff. Like all these plates would go into like – you know when you go to a, like a restaurant or like a catering place and they have these, these boxes and all the food trays slide into them, and they're like ovens. They're portable ovens. They plug oh, in. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's what the time capsules look like. They look like these little hot boxes for, that you have in your, your catering uh, business. But they're, they put all these plates in there. They slide all these plates and records and record players that are solar-powered, that are made from solid gold, blah, blah, blah. They put all this stuff in one of these things, and then they hermetically seal this titanium capsule. So when the, you know... Judgment Day or, you know, whatever you want to call it, happens, yeah. um, then this stuff's all okay. It's on special paper. Uh, okay, now, but here's the best thing. Okay, these guys have been working on this, I guess, since the 80s. We're going to put all this stuff on metal records and metal plates, and they're going to etch all this stuff. Okay, well, they finished all that stuff in the late 90s. Right. Everything. All the books. All the lectures. All the courses, everything in Scientology was etched onto the records, the plates, everything. Okay, that's great. You finished it all. It's all in the capsules. It's in all the vault locations. It's all done. Okay, so how does that work when, when David Miscavige goes and revises all of the books? Oh, and my when, God. How? And when he redoes yeah. the Golden Age of Tech and the Golden Age of Tech Phase 2. And so he's rewritten all of those things at least two or three times since they were put on all these plates. So, Mark, what you're telling me is that the work of the evil SP transcriptions with their semicolons will propagate into eternity. Yeah, that shit's on tight. That's the titan hermetically sealed titanium time capsules inside mountains. In vaults. And so as David, how's that yeah, work? David, You're just going to throw away know. the billions of dollars that you spent on all that and redo it all because David Miscavige found these commas that were really jacking things up. <laughs> well, in his famous speech where he announced the, the basics, and this is funny, he was talking about these transcriptions from the wrong side of the gene pool. He even said, if you read book one and didn't understand it, you're not alone. 
or something like that, you know, one of the books. Yeah. It's like, wait a minute, wait, you were representing all this stuff was ecclesiastical pure, ecclesiastically pure until the day you said it wasn't. Yeah. And he, the, the and event I, when he did it in 1990, they released all this stuff and said everything's been 100% verified as on source. He says that every time they go through it and they find all this stuff. Oh, yeah, everything's been gone through and it's verified as 100% on source. That, they do that every time. But now here's the best part. Okay, there's, there's pictures, there's lectures from L. Ron Hubbard where he's reading out of these books. He's doing lectures and he's got the book in his hand. <laughs> he's reading the book that he wrote in the 50s. And he's using it. So if it's so horrible, well, then how did he use it in these lectures? And how it's just like one of these things where you want to shake one of these Scientologists and go, Do you, how can you believe this guy? He's saying that the dude who wrote all this, who somehow we won't you know, imagine how he came to rise above the bank and, and, and map a way out of the trap of mankind's eternal freedom. How did he do that? But he can't spot a typo? Like, the, the, these guys have this cognitive dissonance, which is like, it's, it, it's actually like a, it's, you can't even call it cognitive dissonance because it's, it's like that, like, cubed you know, how can you have that much cognitive dissonance that this guy can keep telling you every five years? It would literally be like GM saying, you know what? We got this bad thing in the steering wheel. We needed to drive that car off a cliff and come in right away and buy a whole new car. <laughs> and just like, what? <laughs> yep. Oh, it's, you got to either turn that thing in or blow it up, but you can't drive it. It's going to kill you. But you got to come in, and we got to buy another one right now. And actually, don't just buy one; buy two, so you have a spare one in case the new one that we sell you blows up. You can buy another one. Well, you never can be too safe, and that's why they have belt and suspenders. Now, when you're talking about people in the church, one thing I will tell you: they don't read the fine print and details. When I read the IRS submission, something that really jumped out at me about this Church of Spiritual Technology Archival Project. Yeah. They actually admit that in the future, like when we're long gone, that we know it's charred, you know, embers from a nuclear holocaust yeah. or whatever, however it ends. Uh, they're saying the CST told the IRS, they admitted in writing, the biggest vulnerability to our vaults is from vandals and looters. In other words, in a post-apocalyptic civilization, yeah, they're going to melt gonna, stuff down, right? Yeah, they're, they're going to make tent pegs, knives, swords, yeah. u utilitarian items. So what they've done apparently is they've made like five sets of everything, hoping that vandals and looters won't melt it down, but they'll keep one set. And then, and then one of the glaring omissions in the whole CST multi-gazillion dollar archival project, I didn't see anywhere, and I could be wrong, but because they didn't list this, I didn't see anywhere schematics of how to build an e-meter or if there's like super durable e-meters solar powered for future use. Because I got to tell you, one stunning thing people need to realize, Scientology is the only, only uh, religion, if we're going to be generous and call it a religion, is the only religion based on electricity. And if you think about it, Christianity, Islam, all the old religions, they didn't need electricity. Yeah. You can have the Bible without electricity, have Islam without electricity. Scientology needs electricity. So how in the event of an apocalypse when there's no electricity anywhere, how do you do auditing without a meter? That, so the, a lot of the things in the archival project are screwball, yeah. including the fact even though they have these fine linen books that will last a thousand years, people will use the paper for something else. And, you know, they'll burn it for fires. I mean, when you're surviving, you don't care what's written. That's why, you know, even the pyramid itself, at Giza, the limestone casing was stripped off by vandals for use in other temples. Yeah. So I don't think the CST archival project, as much as it's trumpeted, I don't think they've really sought through long term what they're doing. And you raise a good point. How do you how does the Church of Scientology answer the question? There's altered technology buried in these time capsules. Yeah, that means they basically have to bust all those things open and melt all that stuff down. And, you know, it's like it's every – and it's not just one thing. It's everything because all of those policies that talked about auditing, 
they're all mentioning a Mark Super 7. Not even a Mark Super 7 Quantum. They're talking about a Mark Super 7. Well, they've outlawed all those. So that's every legal meters. Yeah, so that's everything that has to do with auditing. Boom, that's it. You just blew all that away. Well, this is another thing. Scientologists don't even know this. Just like they had the golden age of tech and the golden age of tech too. Well, they've been working on since the 1990s the exact same thing for all the organizational policies. So they're going to do the same thing for all of these things that are called the the uh, organization executive course. So it's called the OEC. They're redoing all of the OEC books, and there's tons of things that were altered and all these policies that L. Ron Hubbard didn't write and all these policies that he did write that other people canceled and blah, 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 blah. So, so those have already been put on the plates too. Those are all done. Those are all in the vaults. Well, he hasn't even released that yet. He's been working on that one since the 90s. So that will probably come out you know, in the next five or ten years. And then anybody who's been trained in any kind of uh, administrative technology and Scientology, they're all going to have to go back and you know, do all their stuff all over again. But it's the, the whole thing. The, that's a good point on the vaults and on the, the e-meter because I don't ever remember anything about a solar e-meter. Other people that worked more on e-meters might know about that, but but that's another great point. Like if there is a giant uh, nuclear war or whatever, then you betcha that the ex-Scientologists – because the Scientologists don't know where the CST locations are because they're confidential. No. But all us ex-Scientologists are going to be like, yeah, yeah, we're going, we're going to Montana because I know where there's a whole bunch of gold. <laughs> oh yeah, and 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 one other question that uh, the Church of Spiritual Technology leaves unanswered is how do you get into the vaults? Well, I mean, do you just is there a door or is there a combination lock? Like, how do you break into a nuclear proof vault? I think the whole thing is a ruse. Personally, I think the whole thing's a ruse. I think you got this tunnel which goes, you know, whatever half a mile into the mountain. I'd say half of it is the stuff they say it is. And I say half of it is other stuff. So they could, because cause if you're going to fill a big titanium case with a bunch of gold plated records and nickel in etched plates and all this other stuff, well, who's to say well, I can't just put gold bars in one of them and roll it in there right next to the other one? You're not going to know the difference. They're both going to be so heavy, you're going to have to move it on a conveyor system. So. Oh, Who's to know? Certainly. But, but I gotta find a place to stick a whole bunch of precious metal. Well, this is the perfect place to stick a bunch of precious metal in the middle of a mountain, in hermetically sealed religious artifacts that no one else can open. Oh, I, I've often thought that these were precious metal repositories. Titanium is a very valuable uh, industrial metal. Uh, the stainless steel would be an aside, but yeah, you could really easily store precious metals because here's here's part of the, lo the the flaw in the logic of Trementina. It's out in the middle of nowhere. I've been there. There, yeah. I, okay. Did, did you did you drive there or fly? How do you even get there? I, we drove. It take it took. I'm in Colorado, so it took me a while to drive down to New Mexico. But once we got to the off the paved road. I think it took us a good two hours to get down the dirt road that led into the middle of the desert where the where the secret, you know, alien, as John Sweeney calls it, the alien space cathedral located in the middle, in the <laughs> middle of the desert. But yeah, no, I'm telling you, if if there was a, an apocalyptic war that happened, uh, that would be the furthest place that you could ever get to. It's literally it's so remote that and we did we knew where we were going and it was hard for us to find it. Like there's no maps, there's no there's no cell servers, there's no GPS, there's no nothing where this thing is. We could it was literally almost impossible for us to find it because there's no roads, it's just dirt. It, there's no water nearby. Well, this is the craziest thing. We're driving down this dirt road going through fence after fence and abandoned houses and old windmills from 50 years ago and, you know, all this stuff we're just driving past. Yeah. Like, it's like we're literally driving to our death. <laughs> so there's <laughs> nothing living out here anywhere. It's just death all around us in the middle of the desert. We drive around this corner 
and boom, in the middle of nowhere, it's like a, a futuristic prison with this concrete bunkers and these gates and security <laughs> cameras and an intercom, and it's just like, oh my god, this is so crazy, and there's nothing for miles, and then all of a sudden it's just like, wow, there's a, there it really is a secret compound out in the middle of nowhere in the desert. And sure enough, as soon as we pull up, all the cameras are like, ee, 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 you know, zooming in and panning over to us. And we're just like, wow, this is so crazy. Did security come out? No, no, they, they, they just, uh, we caught, we were like, <laughs> I think there's a, John Sweeney did like a, a little video to promote his book, The Church, I think it's called The Church of Fear. Yeah. Um, and he has... He has a video of us driving out there. I videoed the whole thing. I have a GoPro cameras rigged up in my van, and we drive – the entire trip there is on video and the entire trip out to the base. And, um, and literally, we, he calls them. He's like, hello, this is John Sweeney. I'd like to get a tour. <laughs> it's like eh, – eh, eh, eh. And they just hung up on us. <laughs> it was it was sort of a like wah, wah, wah. after you know a two hour drive out there. You're just like oh boy, that was that was quick. But um, Man, what do you, what would you do if you were stationed out there on duty? Like do you do you dust the vault? Oh, I don't know. I know that there was one guy. I think I can't remember. Dylan Gill was he used to work at CST. He was like the estates manager. Yeah. I think it was either him or somebody else was talking about a guy who killed himself out there. Really? Out of boredom? Well, I, I don't know. It's just you're in the middle of nowhere by yourself or with one other person. It's, it's, That's, a, it's a really slim, slim operation because what are you going to do? You mow the lawns and water the plants. I, what else are you doing? There's no dusting anything. It's inside of a vault. It's sealed. What do you get? Well, the reason I – the reason I mentioned dusting is because in the description, uh, the IRS description, Mark, this is real. This gets to, to the. This is where you can eat rice and beans and make no money by your own toilet paper. But listen, what we're going to do: stainless steel records inside of titanium time capsules. Now, the time capsules have to be wrapped in thermal covers that are based on the same technology as the space shuttle. Then they spent ten million dollars on stainless steel racks to stack them in. Over the racks, they put Kevlar cover, Kevlar dust covers. Yeah. <laughs> and he's going to the vault. I'm thinking, this is really obsessive. I mean, you could do – when you read about transhumanism online, the future of transhumanism is putting, you know, human consciousness into uh, other media, you know, uh, silicon chips, yeah. right? And when you look at spaceships and things, you're looking at uh, digital format and, and, you know, lasers, uh, semiconductors. And I'm thinking uh, they're not even really – they're not thinking about uh, really doing what they're saying. And here's the central contradiction. If, you're can, if you can clear the planet through Scientology, then the planet has a very good future where you don't worry about – nuclear war because you have all the solutions, your group called Scientology. However, if you think it's all going down the drain, you're going to do, you know, you're just going to plan for apocalypse. Yeah. So they're saying one thing that we have safe, effective solutions. We're the experts on mental health, blah, blah, blah. Right. But on the other hand, their real actions is we're planning for the worst. Yeah. And I can't really, you know, I can't get my mind around it saying one thing and doing another. We need ideal orgs for planetary expansion. Oh, but we're planning for Armageddon. It's like, well, which is it, Church of Scientology? Is it going to go up in smoke or are you going to really clear things? But the whole point is they don't even practice what they preach, so why does it yeah, matter? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the basic rule that you always have to apply to Scientology, which is don't try to make sense of it. <laughs> that, that, that's the first thing you have to know. There, when dealing with Scientology... Don't try to make sense of it because it will not make sense. There's, there's no way you can take what they're saying or what they're doing and fit that into a mold where you go, okay, I get that. Because like they have billions of dollars, so why are they trying to get the parishioners to pay for the buildings? Why don't they just go buy a bunch of buildings and be done with it? They could finish, yeah. they could finish it this year. Just say, you know what? We got 50 buildings left. Here, we just bought them. Okay, We just bought 50 buildings. We're done. Yeah, Why are we messing around? We're dragging it out. We've been doing the 
What's this orc? They've been doing the Valley Orc. They've been working <laughs> working on the Valley Orc for ten years now. Okay, we're, this 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 is a year where we finally. I think they. I think I saw it as on Mike Rinder or somebody sent me this thing, link or whatever. It says we finally got the designs approved. <laughs> this is like it's been ten years. You guys bought the building like five years ago. <laughs> you just got the yeah. designs approved. Like. It took you five years to design it. Are you kidding me? I've worked on oh, buildings. I've worked on buildings that took a year to design. It was a dirt field before we got there. Okay, and and a year or two later, it's built. I just saw them build a Holiday Inn next to my shop. Uh, you know, last year this time it was a dirt field. There's a building there right now, so it's a Holiday Inn. Okay, fine, but I mean, whatever. It's a building. It's they've already built a gazillion of these things. It's how hard is it to design a bunch of tiny rooms you're going to lock people up and interrogate them, and then you got a bunch of fancy rooms with a bunch of TVs in them, show people videos that no one's ever going to watch. It's, it's not Mark, that hard. Mark, that's exactly the point. Look, the superpower building, whatever they're calling it, their cathedral there in Clearwater, it's a glorified office building. Yeah. That's all it is. Yeah. It's a glorified office building, and okay, so it's got some nice marble, whatever. It should have done like 18 to 24 months tops. Oh, yeah. If, if you gave me a bunch of money, it's no big deal to go. I would hire some real estate attorneys and contractors. Here, Here's the money. Do a turnkey building. I need to open 18 months. Yeah. They took whatever, like close to 20 years to do the superpower building. And you're right. They do drag things out. They do overcharge. And and they do it on top of slave labor. Yeah. Well, th I mean, that building is a great example because – when I arrived at the property in, I'm going to say, 1990, they were working on that building. On the superpower building. They were working building. on designing the superpower building in 1990, okay? And, okay, so 1990, they – okay, 1990 is when they started, and they finished it what? Uh, last year? Was it last year they finished? Yeah, yeah. They, 2013. Yeah, they just opened 2013. It. Yeah. So it took them, what is that? That's 1990, 2000? Tw 23 years. So 23, 23 years. They built the Empire State Building during the Depression. They started in 1929. They finished it in 1931. The Empire State Building. That's amazing. It's the largest building in the world for like 40 years, and they built it in two years in, during the Depression. Okay? So – and, and I, you know what? I would wonder how much they spent on it. I think they spent – I think they spent $40 million. On well, yeah, the Empire that's, State Building? Yeah, that's, but that's probably $40 million, 1930 well, money, but whatever. But either way yeah. – they built the thing in two years during the Depression. Okay, it's the Empire State Building. Okay, the, the superpower building is probably about as it's probably about the footprint of the Empire State Building. I bet you. Probably, That's yeah. Four stories, like, right? It's like I don't know. Yeah. It's not that many stories. It's not more than five or six stories. No, but but as someone someone wrote a long time ago, a uh, Scientology critic wrote. The superpower building was the most profitable empty building in the world because they could keep raising m money on this thing ad infinitum. Oh, yeah. And and I think had it not been for the Luis Garcia lawsuit, it would still not be opened. Why? Because they don't have anything to deliver, and it's easier to just keep taking people's money for an unopened building. Yeah, but I think I think they raised. I want to say they raised hundreds of millions of dollars for that building. Oh, it's got to be a lot. Yeah, it was it was an excess of the cost of the building. Yeah. And, There's no uh, way that building cost whatever they raised. <laughs> no. But that's, the, I guess, the beauty of it for David Miscavige. Mark, we're winding up this hour. I'd like to have you back again to continue because people love the nuts and bolts and details of the Scientology religion, and you're so interesting to talk to. In concluding this episode... I always like to have you give a message to people who are still in the church or in the Sea Org. What would you say to them? I'd say ask questions. And uh, if you can't get your question answered, that's a really good sign. And as always, your friends that you had in Scientology that got kicked out or that left or whatever, they will welcome you with open arms when you come out. And there is – it's a fact. There are more ex-Scientologists – 
than there are Scientologists. So probably a lot of more people that you know that are ex-Scientologists than that are currently still practicing. And I and I'd also tell I'd also tell them that you'd be surprised on how many of your Scientology friends are no longer Scientologists. Well spoken, and thank you, Mark. We'll catch up with you again on the next. Uh, on the next episode. And for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is Jeffrey Augustine, and, and as always, we'll be in very good touch. If you want to find us online, we are at survivingscientologyradio.com. Thank you for listening.